what we're going to talk about is partial fractions. Now, although trig substitutions are wonderful, well, you might not think they're absolutely wonderful, but they do help us solve a kind of problem we weren't able to solve before. They only solve so much. So we were able to use trig substitutions in these cases, where our integrals contained an a squared minus x squared, an a squared plus x squared, or an x squared minus a squared. But say instead I had something like this. Well, that is certainly a quadratic in the denominator, but it doesn't match any of the forms that I can use a trig substitution for. So what to do? Well, I'm going to ask you, could you do this integration instead? Well, hopefully that answer is yes. I could easily do this integration, and then I could combine it using some of my logarithmic properties. And remember, I can get rid of the absolute value bars once I go ahead and square that x plus 4. And then lastly, I would have this. Now on a side note, sometimes people have problems simplifying their logarithms. And if you turn to something like Wolfram Alpha to help, well, it doesn't simplify the logarithmic functions for you. So what we could do is go to a graphing application, such as Desmos. To use something like Desmos to check to see if I've got the right simplification, all I have to do is type in my initial solution, making sure that we're being careful with our absolute value bars. All right, here's our first function. This is before we simplified it. Now I'm going to graph the same expression, but this time I'm going to use my logarithmic simplifications. And lo and behold, they are the exact same graph. You should get used to checking your own work before you type in your answers or write out your answers for homework, because that'll help you find your mistakes before you get too wrapped up into why your answer doesn't match the answer in the back of the book or why the software is telling you that you have the wrong answer. All right, so why did I go into a big discussion about the simplified version on the right? Well, that's because these two expressions are actually equal to each other. Let's go ahead and show that. On the right hand side I'm going to write that as a common denominator and on the left hand side I'm going to factor that denominator and when I do that and if I simplify my numerator I'll see that that does in fact equal 3x. So these two expressions are equal to each other. The question is how do I know how to break down this complicated looking fraction in the left hand side and get it into the form of something I can easily integrate. Well that's where we're going to use partial fractions. We're going to start off talking about partial fractions with simple linear factors. That is something that looks like this. I have something in the form of f of x over q of x that I'm trying to integrate. And the q of x, the q of x can be factored into a form that looks like this. These are simple linear factors. That is, there's none of these factors that are raised to a power other than 1, and my x is simply x. It's not x squared. It's got to be a linear factor. We'll learn how to do the other cases, but let's start off with our simple linear factors. So the first thing you do is, well, you factor your denominator. The second thing we do is rewrite the fraction as i separate fractions, where i is the number of factors, with an unknown constant in each numerator. So let's do this to the example I just showed you. I first go ahead and make two separate fractions and then I put an unknown constant in the numerators. These are going to be separate constants so we want to use a, b, c, etc. And what do we do from here? Well if I wanted to really add these together I'd have to put them in terms of a common denominator. So to do that they're both going to have to have this is their common denominator. But of course I can't just multiply the denominator by something without also multiplying the numerator by the same amount. Now, if I asked you to tell me what x is equal to, you would tell me it was 3. All you need to do is look at the separate numerators. The denominators being the same means that as long as the numerators are equal to each other, this whole equation is true. So we're going to do the same thing here. We're going to totally ignore the denominators and just set the numerators equal to each other. We'll do some algebra, and then I'll do something strange. I'll add a plus zero on the left-hand side of this equation. The reason why I'm doing that is because it's easier for me to have something there, so that way when I'm equating my constants and my variables, I can keep track of things better. So the first thing I'm going to do is look at all my terms with x in them. And I'm going to set those equal to each other. The next thing I'm going to do is look at my constants and set those equal to each other. 
I'm going to call the first one equation 1 and the second one equation 2. I'm going to take equation 2 and I'm going to solve it for one of my variables. And in this case I find that b is equal to 2 times a. I'm going to take that result and plug it into my first equation. I'm going to replace b with 2a and then I find that a is equal to 1. If a is equal to 1, then that means that b must be equal to the number 2. Which means if I go back to my original equation, I can say that 3x over x minus 2, x plus 4, equals 1 over x minus 2, plus 2 over x plus 4. Now it doesn't matter which one I used first. I could have put my x plus 4 with the a and the x minus 2 with the b. At the end, we should all get the same constants over the same denominators. Let's look at one that's a little bit more complex. All right, let's look at this one. We're going to first of all have to factor the denominator. Now, if you're ever stuck on a factoring problem, like if you look at this and think, I don't even know where to begin, once I showed you how to do it, you would say, oh, that's right. All I need to do is first pull out that x. But if you're ever stuck, again, you can go to Wolfram Alpha and just type in that denominator. And under alternate forms, it'll factor it for you. And then I continue factoring. All right, so now let's do the, our partial fraction decomposition. I'll do the same thing that I did last time. I'll make a common denominator, and then I'll just equate the numerators. And I'll do some algebra, and now I'll sort my terms. I'm going to suggest on exams, it's going to sound silly, but if you bring colored pencils, it helps keep track of the different coefficients that you're collecting. There's my x squared terms, here are my linear terms, and finally my constants. I'll call these equations 1, 2, and 3. Equation 3 tells us that a is equal to the number 1, and then I'll put that into equations 1 and 2. And I'll use elimination, and I come up with c is equal to negative 2. And here I'll find that b is equal to 4. So I go back to my original fractions and plug in my a's and b's and c's. So if I wanted to integrate the left-hand side, all I would have to do is integrate these easy fractions, and use my logarithmic properties to simplify, and of course I won't forget my plus c. Let's look what happens when we do have something beyond our simple linear factors. Let's first look at repeated linear factors. That is, if I had something like x minus r to the nth power. What we're going to do is split this up into separate fractions with x minus r, and then x minus r squared, x minus r cubed, etc., up until x minus r to the nth power. So let's look at this problem. Like before, I'm going to factor the denominator, but now I'm going to have to use my new rule about repeated linear factors. That is, I'm going to set this up as a over x, as b over x squared, and then c over x minus 2. But from here, I'm going to do the exact same thing that I did before. What's missing in the denominator of a is an extra x and an x minus 2, so I'll multiply the numerator and denominator by that. b is only missing the x minus 2, and c is missing just the x squared. So when I look at just the numerators, I'll have this. I'll look at all the x squared terms and set them equal to each other. I'll take all the linear terms and all the constants. I think I've taken care of all my terms, so now I'll go ahead and I'll do some algebra. Equation 3 tells me that b is equal to negative 1, and then I can directly from equation 2 see that a is equal to 1, and finally from equation 1 I find out that c is equal to 4. And that's my partial fraction decomposition. If I wanted to integrate, I would get this, and if I combined everything using my logarithmic properties, well not everything, the 1 over x is going to have to stay out of it, I end up with this. So what happens if I had something that was an irreducible quadratic factor, such as this? That is, I have an ax squared plus bx plus c in my denominator that can't be factored. You should say at this point, wait a second, I'm pretty sure we've done something like this before. I remember doing this. And what we did was we completed the square. So I don't have to bother with partial fractions in this case. I could just go back to completing the square. Well, that's true, but what if instead of something like this, I gave you a problem like this? 
Huh. Although I could complete the square for that second factor in the denominator, I've got the first one to fuss about, so I'm not going to be able to just use complete the square in this case. So what I'm going to do is tell you our new rule. Instead of looking for an a and a b, I'm going to look for an ax plus b. So in this case, my irreducible quadratic factor, it stays as one single fraction, but now the numerator is going to have an x in it, as well as a constant. So to do this one, and right now I'm going to pretend that we're not integrating, I still need my a over x minus 2. That's from this first factor. But now my second factor will be this. So again, I'm going to compare my numerators, and even though I'm not showing it, all I've done is, as I've done before, I multiplied the denominator and the numerator of a by x squared minus 2x plus 3, because that was not already in the denominator. And for the bx plus c, I needed to multiply the numerator and denominator by x minus 2 in order to get the denominators the same. As before, I use some algebra to multiply this out, and then I equate matching coefficients. I look at my x squared, my x, and my constants. And now I have to solve for a, b, and c. This one's a little bit more complicated than our previous ones, but we can find that a is equal to 5. Once we know a is equal to 5, it's easy to find that b is equal to 2. And lastly, c has to be equal to positive 1. So I'll put those back into the partial fractions I set up, replacing the a, b, and c, 5, 2, and 1. And now when I integrate, now integrating the first term, We've done this a bunch before. But this one is a little bit more complex. So we have done this with completing the square, and we'll actually have to end up completing the square. But when we did previously problems like this, there was only a constant in the numerator. There wasn't an x in the numerator before. So now we're kind of stuck. Except not really. I know if I have something squared in the denominator, its derivative would be x, and that's in the numerator, so I'm thinking a u sub might work here. Let's try it. Let's let u equal that whole nasty denominator. In that case, du is equal to 2x minus 2 dx. Okay, that's close to what we have, but not quite. And this is what makes, I think, Calc 2 such a tough class, is we've always got to be able to come up with al algebraic manipulations in order to take what we have and turn it into something that we want. So I want this numerator not to be 2x plus 1, I want this numerator to be 2x minus 2. And at that point you should say, ah, oh, excuse me Professor Yagadich, you can't just make that plus 1 into a negative 2, and I say, oh yes I can, I'm just going to add 3 to it, because negative 2 plus 3 is in fact positive 1. So now what I need to do is split this up into two separate integrals. The middle term, I'm just going to be using my u sub that I came up with before, and the last term I'm going to have to use my completing the square technique from earlier in this chapter. To complete the square, I take the negative 2 divided by 2, make that squared, I still have my plus 3, but now when I completed the square, I added an additional plus 1, because negative 1 times negative 1 is positive 1, so I need to subtract 1 in order to keep this the same expression. We're going to recall one of our trigonometric integrals is simply this, so I know my third integral, and as long as I'm here I'm going to plug back in my u that I had above, plus 3 times 1 over square root of 2, because remember, if I have a 2 there, the formula is the integral of dx over x squared plus a squared, which means a has to be square root of 2. I'll put my plus c in there, and now I'll combine my natural logs using my logarithmic properties. So those are our three ways that we can use partial fractions. Simple linear factors will break it up into separate fractions with a, b, etc. If I have a repeated factor, I'm doing the same thing, but I remember if I have something squared, for instance, I need the original, and then I need the squared version. And finally, simple non-reducible quadratic forms will use ax plus b in the numerator.